Bethel, married. Married. Virya. Virya. A valor or prowess. A valor or prowess. I mean, the heroism and strength and determination, freedom from fear. Panam. Panam. The prize. Vaidarbim. Daughter of Vitarba. Malayat Vajaha, Malayat Vaja, Yudhi in the fight, Near Jitsha after conquering, Rajanyan, other princes, Panjaha, best of the learned, or born in the country known as Pandu. Para, Para. Transcendental. Transcendental. Puram, Puram. City. City. Jaya. Jaya. Conqueror. Conqueror. So translation, it was fixed that Vidar B, the daughter of King Vidarbha, was to be married to a very powerful man, Maya, Malaya Dwaja, an inhabitant of the Pandu country. After conquering other princes, he married the daughter of King Vidarbha. So, purport by his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki. It is customary among Kshatriyas for a princess to be offered under certain conditions. For instance, Draupadi was offered in marriage to one who could pierce a fish with an arrow simply by seeing the reflection of that fish. Krishna married one of his queens after conquering seven strong bulls. The Vedic system is for the, a daughter of a king to be offered under certain conditions. Vaidarbi, the daughter of Vidarbha, was offered to a great devotee and powerful king. Since King Malaya Dwaja was both a powerful king and a great devotee, he fulfilled all requirements. Hmm. The name Malaya Dwaja signifies a great devotee who stands as firm as the Malaya Hills and through his propaganda makes other devotees similarly as firm. Such a Mahabhadwat can prevail over the opinions of all others. A strong devotee makes propaganda against all other spiritual conceptions, namely Yana Kanama and Yoga. With his devotional flag unfurled. Huh. That's interesting. He always stands fast to conquer other conceptions of transcendental realization. Whenever there is an argument between a devotee and a non-devotee, the pure strong devotee comes out victorious. The word Panja comes from the word Panda, meaning knowledge. Unless one is highly learned, he cannot conquer non-devotional conceptions. The word para means transcendental and pura means city. The para pura is vaikuntha, the kingdom of God, and the word jaya refers to one who can conquer. This means that a pure devotee who is strong in devotional service and who has conquered all non-devotional conceptions can also conquer the kingdom of God. In other words, one can conquer the kingdom of God by kuntha, only by rendering devotional service. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is called ajitta, meaning that no one can conquer him, but a devotee by strong devotional service and sincere attachment to the Supreme Personality of Godhead can easily conquer him. Lord Krishna is fear personified for everyone, but he voluntarily agreed to fear the stick of Mother Yashoda. Krishna, God, cannot be conquered by anyone but his devotee. Such a devotee kindly married the daughter of King Vidarbha. So, Upiyame viryaha panam vaidarvim madayat vajaha yudhi nirjit jaran jan jan apanya para puranjaya Om Gana Timananda Shah Gananjana Shvakaya Chakshur and Minitam Yena Tazmai Shigabe Maha. So, the first thing discussed here is uh, the marriage of a princess. And uh, there are many different uh, Kshatriya systems of marriage, and none of them 
are really like marriage just by, whoa, falling in love, except for the Gandharva marriage. Anyway, so there's three basic systems of Kshatriya marriage. One is being described here as the uh, Swayam Vara. Now the interesting thing, even though it's described that Vaidarabhi was a Panam, which is the word used here as prize. <laughs> really, the word Swayamvara means she can pick her own. You understand? It's not that, you know, she's just like, like we discussed yesterday, trophy wife. Remember that? We were talking about that. So it's not that, you know, she's up there and then you fight and you get the trophy and she, she can say no. I don't want that creep. Just like she said, what Draupadi said when Karna was there, Karna was getting ready to compete. He was a king at that particular point uh, because he had been appointed by Duryodhana. And she said, no, I don't want to accept him. He's a Shudra. Well, whatever reason she gave, that was Shudra, basically. And so he had to walk away from the whole thing. So the woman had the right of the refusal so that's one type of Kshatriya marriage, which we have a lot of examples of in uh, Krishna's pastimes. And of course, Prabhupada cites uh, the one pastime of uh, Nagnajiti. Nagnajiti, his father was named Nagnajit. It's interesting. Actually, the, sometimes the daughter is named after the father, like Vaidarbha, Vaidarbi. Isn't it? It's interesting. Uh, so, anyway, so Nagnajit uh, said to everyone, my daughter will only marry someone who can fight seven bulls simultaneously. And that's pretty hard, isn't it? Not one at a time. And so Krishna was the one who divided himself into seven different forms and he uh, killed seven bulls or captured them, not actually killed them. Krishna doesn't kill bulls unless they're demons. He captured them simultaneously and he married uh, Nanda Jati. So that's an instance of a Swayamvara. So another type of Kshatriya marriage is called the Gandharva marriage. Gandharva marriage is, you save a lot of money with a Gandharva marriage because you don't have to pay for the uh, sacrifice. Like in India, sometimes the marriages go for three <coughs> days or a week and I have friends who spent hundreds of thousands of euros on their wedding. I'm sure you know that in India, isn't it? I mean, they just like, ugh, incredible what they'll spend. And they go into debt for the next 30 years, even though you know, I have friends who were like, were 50 years old and they got their daughter married, 50 or 60 actually, had heart attacks and had to go into debt for the rest of their lives paying off for their daughter's wedding. Uh, I don't agree with that one. Anyway, so the Gandharva marriage is a marriage where the boy and girl meet and he says, I love you. She says, I love you too. They exchange garlands and that's it. An example of that is Maharaj Shantanu and Ganga Devi. You understand? Shantanu was minding his business along the banks of the Ganges and this beautiful girl Ganga Devi comes out and he says, Wow, that's a love marriage. Anyway, and she says, all right, I'll marry you. Only if you never disagree with me. That's a good prenuptial agreement, isn't it? All you ladies who ever get married, you should think like that. Say like that. This is an agreement. You should never disagree, never talk back to me. Then I'll get married. And he was so bewildered. That's the problem. Nunam pramata kurte vikarma yadindriya priti apranoti. Right? Anyone know that verse? No, it's Lord Rishabhali who's standing. Nunam pramata. Just like we talked yesterday about the word pramada referring to ladies, remember? You remember yesterday's class? Yeah. Pramada or stri, right? Remember? So, nunam pramata kurte vikarma. One is bewildered by this idea of enjoying the senses, kurute uh, karma. then he commits, what, vikarmic activities, uh, because he considers his senses to be very dear. So anyway, 
So because Shantanu was just so enamored, he thought, this girl will never do anything wrong any, or say anything bad. Why? What is the logic? Because she's so pretty. Very logical, isn't it? I mean, if you have to connect the dots, it's really hard, you know. Someone will never say anything bad because they're pretty. Or a man will always be nice because he has muscles. Macho, right? Logic, illogical. Anyway, love is illogical. Material love is illogical. I cannot understand it, never have been, never will be able to understand it. So, anyway, so he became bewildered and he gave his promise, I'll never disagree with you, and she began to kill all the kids, right? One after the other, throwing them into the Ganges. And eventually he did disagree with her on the eighth kid because that was Bhishma. So, that's another story. So that's called the Gandharva marriage. But the most interesting Vedic marriage that I can think of is the Rakshasa marriage. Rakshasa marriage is the marriage where the girl is uh, kidnapped. It's so romantic, isn't it? What happened? Why is she kidnapped? Well, love. So anyway, so... <laughs> Because also she's choosing her own. She, it's not that she's dragged away against her will. Sometimes it may happen. But generally she likes it. Like with the case of Subhadra. Subhadra was really upset with the marriage arrangement that they had made. And that was to Duryodhana. And she was thinking, uh, basically... I want to marry Arjuna. And Arjuna was happened to be there at the same time, dressed up as a sannyasi, a very romantic sannyasi. The story's there in, in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna book. And Arjuna basically kidnaps her. So that's called Rakshasa marriage. Krishna also did the same thing sometimes too, with Rukmini. Rukmini wanted to marry Krishna because she had heard about Krishna. And basically... She sent a Brahmin messenger to Krishna telling him how to kidnap her. And she said, actually the best time is when I go to the temple of Durga, Kachiyani, and then when I come out of the temple, just grab me. And she was so pretty that when the uh, other persons would come to see the marriage or possibly get married to her, saw her, they fainted, they fell off their horses. <laughs> It's interesting. And then Krishna kidnapped her. So those are the three types of Kshatriya marriage. Now, generally, I said the general principle is the Kshatriya marriage is an arranged marriage. Arranged, and there's a competition, two things. That's a general principle. Gandhara, Rakshasa may be a little bit exceptional. And there's reasons for that. The reasons for arranged marriages, rather than love marriages, is that people will generally, with love marriages, marry someone without consideration of compatibility, without consideration of service to society. Uh, because in the Vedic culture, in the Varnashram culture, one was thinking not simply of one's own enjoyment. See, this, it's a different mindset than we have here in the Western world. Uh, in the Western world, our mindset is my enjoyment or boast, or best, sorry, at best, what we call the nuclear family. You know what a nuclear family is? Nuclear family means man, his wife, and kids. Or more kids, kids whatever. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's a nuclear family. Uh, in India, of course, you have the extended family. Man, Wife, kids, mother, mother-in-law, father-in-law, what else? Aunts, uncles, village, people, right? You got big family. In the West, we, we don't actually recognize, I was just talking to Sri Govinda, in the, that here in Finland, you don't even recognize the family as more than just the husband and the wife and the children, right? If you say, I'd like to bring my mother, they say, mother's not part of your family, isn't that? That's unfortunate because 
Anyway, you should just put her in old people's home and forget about her and enjoy life. So this is the modern culture, even in India, in any country, is that, you know, just, if you got an old person, well, they should just go put them in a government home. You could visit them once a month. And when they get ready to die, put some radicun water in their mouths. So they hopefully go back to Godhead. But the, but the Vedic culture was based upon more of the extended family, and even more than that. Marriages were arranged for the good of society, particularly Kshatriya marriages and Brahmin marriages. One of the reasons for the arranged marriage is so that people could think about, and we talked about this actually in Sweden, people can think about eugenics. Now, for those of you who don't know what that word means, breeding. Now, that's gotten a negative connotation nowadays, eugenics, because then you think about Hitler, right? How Hitler was interested in the master race and everything like that and getting rid of people who he thought uh, would not be capable or not worthy of reproducing. But in the Vedic conception, people thought, you know, you got to have a good king, right? How do you get a good king? You have to have good parents. That's the way, because, as they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> so, unless one takes the Krishna consciousness, and then, of course, one's nature can change. But generally, one takes after the parents. In fact, the prophet said, generally, the son takes after the mother, and uh, the daughter takes after the father, which is really interesting. That's why when uh, Maharaj Anga had a son named Vena, the son took after the mother. The mother was the daughter of fear personified. So the son was really bad. And he was so bad that he used to kill his friends when he went out to play with his friends. The story's there in Bhagavatam. And, you know, really hellish. Hellish kid. Eventually the Brahmins had to kill him. So the, there was so much stress on creating good leaders in society. So much stress. I mean, even to a certain degree, well, it used to be in Great Britain, they would actually not marry, so recently things have changed, of course. Uh, recent, recently they marry commoners, you know. You understand commoners? Just like recently you had a marriage in England where they married someone from America. I love marriage. Anyway, so, but previously in England, it was actually restricted. You had to marry someone in the royal dynasty. I'm not saying that's good in England. I mean, the royal dynasty in England has its problems, uh, particularly one of the members of the royal dynasty wanted a divorce and he uh, made a whole church so he could get a divorce. Remember? Henry VIII. No, you don't know about him? Henry VIII, he was a king in England. And there was, because they were following the Catholic Church, there were no divorces allowed. And he wanted to get a divorce. Because he, you know, didn't like his wife. And so, he thought, well, the first wife he actually killed. Because it wasn't time to make the church. So after a while he made his own church that allowed divorces. That's the Anglican Church. He's the founding father of the Anglican Church. In case you didn't know that. So, so anyway, so getting back to the point, so it was considered that you had to have someone genetically, you know, there's under, there was understandings, an understanding of genetics in the Vedic culture. Uh, it's not something new. Even they did genetic engineering. Did you know that? They did genetic engineering. They were so advanced in science. That's like when, getting back to that story of Vena, when Vena was killed by the Brahmanas, you know, by their mantra, they didn't use knives, they engineered his genes to get another king. That's good. They called it churning. They engineered his genes. How did they do that? They got rid of the bad genes first. Right? That became someone named Bahuka. And the good genes became an incarnation of God and Lakshmi. Right? Prithu and Archie. Stories there in the Bhagavatam. So that's an incident of genetic engineering. Another in incident is, this is an interesting story. Maharaj Nimi, 
uh, once upon a time, had a disagreement with his guru. His guru was Vishishta Muni. And Vishishta Muni wanted to do a sacrifice on the heavenly planets because there were better donations there. And so, and Maharaj Nimi wanted to do a sacrifice on the earth planet and he needed his guru and the guru said, wait for me. And he didn't wait for his guru to come back from the heavenly planets because that takes a long time when you go up to the heavenly planets. You know, one moment is like years. And so his guru got very upset, cursed him to die. He said, my dear disciple, you shall die. You shall become near Deha. And so the disciple died. You know, that's, and the disciple got angry with his guru too. <laughs> Don't do that, though, you know. Uh, <laughs> and the disciple said to, Mara, uh, to Vishishta Muni, you should die, Guru Maharaj. And they both died. And Vishishta Muni, of course, later came back to life through the seminar of Mitra and Varuna. But that's a different story. And Maharaj Nimi, his body was preserved. And the Brahmanas wanted to bring him back to life. And they tried, and he said, I don't want to come back to life. I want to be back with Krishna. Why the heck do I want to come back to this world again? And so what they did, they let him die, and they took his body, and they genetically cloned him. And they came out with a whole bunch of kings, with the first king, of course. And that was the dynasty in which uh, Sita Devi was there, Janaka. Janaka the first, Janaka the second, Janaka the third, and all the way up to Sita Devi's father, Janaka Maharaj, who was a Mahajana. Anyway, so they knew genetic engineering. So getting back to the point that I'm making here about this particular verse, is that's why marriages were arranged. And that's also why they had competition. Because if someone was going to be a king, he had to be strong, not only mentally, but physically. Because the king would be at the forefront of the battle. Not like the modern day presidents, prime ministers, what is it? Secretary of Defense, whatever you have in different countries. They just sit in a hardened bunker. You know what a bunker is? You know, underground, protected from nuclear attacks. And they, they tell their soldiers what to do. And that's not the Vedic system. And it really even wasn't the system in Europe. You had Alexander the Great, for example, remember him? Actually, he was born in Macedonia, not Greece. But anyway, he was... And he went all the way to India. And he was leading his army. It's not that he was just giving orders over the internet. Of course, there wasn't internet at that time. But he was leading his army in the forefront. And that's a hero. That's how, how a king has to be. He can't just be some, like, old booger, you know, just that... Sorry about the word. An old guy <laughs> sitting in his comfortable leather chair, directing the soldiers. So, so therefore, the, part of the test, there was a reason for it, was competition, you know, Kshatriya competition with bows, arrows, whatever, and to, to get his wife. And therefore, you have the proper genetic mix to uh, have a proper king. And also, that particular method of getting married, you know, where there's a conquering over your enemies, uh, there was also blood involved in that. Obviously, when you fight with your enemies, there's blood. And that's where the uh, Vedic or Hindu system of putting the red on the wife's head comes from. Nowadays, of course, you don't use blood anymore, do you? You didn't use blood. <laughs> but <laughs> that's where it comes from. That here's the blood of my enemies. And the red dot, and that signifies. Then, then the wife also, another point is, the wife considers the husband to be a hero at that point. It's another important point in marriages, that the husband has to be like heroic, not only in the Kshatriya marriage, but in any sort of marriage, the husband has to be seen by the wife as 
heroic, doing something, maintaining her, protecting her. You know, that's the image. That's what marriage means. Uh, not that the, you know, not that the, the wife is maintaining, protecting, of course, that's Kali Yuga. The wife joins the army and protects the husband. Anyways, <laughs> so the, this is the difference between male and female psychology. So anyway, so this is one point here. Then above that, above being a great, strong person, Prabhupada makes the comment here that the husband should be a great devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And this is the second point Prabhupada makes in the purport. That just like a king, and Prabhupada does make this comparison to preaching Krishna consciousness. He said it's like Kshatriya activity. At one point Prabhupada said, this is a very interesting comment. Prabhupada said, We're not, we don't want like sit down devotees. <laughs> We want devotees who are fighters. You know what I'm saying? Not sit down, enjoy life, just Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, oh, it's so nice. Gopi, 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 Radhe, Radhe, Jai, Hari Bol. <laughs> no, I mean, what was Prabhupada's mood? I mean, if you look at a picture, of Prabhupada, or the picture of Prabhupada when he first took sannyas, standing next to his guru, Keshava Maharaj. You seen the picture? He looks like he's holding a gun. And says, Danda, it's not a gun. Yeah, Prabhupada didn't shoot guns. And he's, you know, so staunch. He's just like, wow, he's out to conquer the world. And that was Prabhupada's mood. Even at the very end, like the devotees were saying to Prabhupada before he went to London, that just stay here in Vrindavan. And then Prabhupada said, give me the benediction of dying on the battlefield. Isn't it? I mean, we've heard that story before. Give me the benediction of dying on the battlefield, fighting for Krishna. And Prabhupada, I mean, if you look at Prabhupada's or just hear Prabhupada's classes sometimes, especially the early days in New York. You listen to some of the early New York classes, like 1966. It's like a shatriya fighting, you know, challenging. And of course, Prabhupada in his dealings with the Mayavadis, you know, he would sometimes say the impersonalist Mayavadis or rascal scientists, not all scientists, Prabhupada say we kick on their faces with boots. I mean, that's a shatriya mentality, isn't it? It's a fighting mentality. Or how Prabhupada dealt with the situation in Mumbai when Prabhupada was negotiating with this Mr. Nair. Some of you may know this story. Uh, Mr. Nair had the habit previously, before he so-called sold the land to Prabhupada in Bombay, of selling the land to people and then by trick taking it back and keeping their money. So Prabhupada was so, not only fighting tricky, but fighting, but he was, he was really strategic, like a Kshatriya too. I mean, one time, it's an interesting story, Prabhupada was uh, talking to Mr. Nair after the devotees had canceled the sale contract. Tamal Krishnamaraj had canceled the sale contract and Prabhupada was really upset with him because Mr. Nair had bewildered the devotees. So Prabhupada uh, went back to meet with Mr. Nair, and Mr. Nair, in order to avoid becoming bewildered by Prabhupada, brought his guru with him. You know, whatever type of guru it was, you know, that was going to do some mystic things to protect him from Prabhupada. Because Prabhupada was really powerful. So what happened is that Prabhupada, Mr. Nair, and Mr. Nair's guru, they were sitting there, they took some prasadam, and Prabhupada being very tricky, he yawned. You know, <sighs> you know, he wasn't tired, but he just yawned. And Mr. Nair said, oh, you, you look tired, you know, we should all take rest. And Prabhupada said, yes, good idea. Let's all take rest. So, okay. So Mr. Nair and his guru were sleeping in one room and resting like that. Prabhupada doesn't go to sleep. 
he says to the devotees, I think it was Tamalka Shmarj, he said, go very quietly into Mr. Nair's room. Wake him up, but don't wake his guru up. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Kshatriya stuff, you know, like strategy, politics, for Krishna. Isn't it? So oh, what happens is that Mr. Nair comes out, and Prabhupada, of course, Mr. Nair is just like groggy from sleeping. You know, perfect strategy. The poor guy is like, Whoa, where are we? Huh? You know, you wake someone up right when they go to sleep, they don't have all their senses. They're completely, you know, spaced out, as the case goes. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada makes him sign the contract again. <laughs> It's just like, huh? I mean, that's Shatri stuff, you know, like fighting, you know. Because Shatri doesn't only mean fight with your hands or, you know, challenging. It means you, you think very strategically about things and you plan things out. Probably had the whole thing planned out. Very intelligent, super intelligent, you know, strategic. And then he signs the contract. Uh, and still Mr. Nair, you know, was really nasty after that point. And then eventually Mr. Nair dies. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada basically makes a statement, it's almost, almost like a Kshatriya statement, that uh, even the sages get uh, become happy when a snake is killed. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just, definitely that's the mood in preaching Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada. And, and then, of course, after we finally get the, the uh, property after Mr. Nair's wife tries to interfere with the whole thing after Mr. Nair dies and Prabhupada is very strategic with her too, comforting her and telling her, you're just like my daughter, I'll make sure you're all right. You know, this is very strategic. And he also was honest too. Uh, then Prabhupada has a victory dinner. And then later on, when he talks about it, even when Prabhupada is getting ready to leave the world, he talks about the victory with Mr. Nair, like reliving that victory. Wasn't that great, you know? So that's, I'm just trying to show you the mood that Prabhupada had in preaching Krishna consciousness. I want to speak of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's mood. He was known as Nishringa Guru, right? I mean, he would walk up to people who are preaching in personalism, grab them by the neck, you know, the scruff of the neck, like the shirt, and say, why are you wearing a shirt? Why don't you just wear a piece of cotton if everything is one? And people would run away from him to avoid him. I mean, I mean this, is, this is our heritage, you know, preaching strongly. Uh, we mentioned it the other day, he was preaching against this bogus mantra in uh, Jagannath Puri. And he preached so strongly, there were people getting ready to kill him. And he, had, he even had attempts on his life when they were going, taking his devotees on Parikrama around Vrindavan, there, there was a, they had bribed the police chief, right? To look the other way if he was killed. Another time, one of his disciples had to put on his robes so he could escape so he wouldn't be killed. You know, and a disciple dressed as him because there was an attempt on his life. Another time, he refused to have a hernia operation because there was an attempt, he, they might have killed him in the hospital because he was such a fighter. This is, I mean, this is the point Prabhupada is making. Such a Maha Bhagavad Prabhupada says, can prevail over the opinions of all others. A strong devotee makes propaganda against all other spiritual conceptions, namely jnana, karma, and yoga. With his devotional flag unfurled, he always stands fast to conquer. This is Prabhupada's move that he's bringing out here. To conquer other conceptions of transcendental realization. Whenever there is an argument between a devotee and a non-devotee, the pure, strong devotee comes out victorious. And, and an argument I can think of right now was when uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur went to argue with the ritualistic brahmanas. Actually, the head of the ritualistic brahmanas was a Vipini Bihari Goswami, who was the guru of Bhakti, you know, Thakur, which is interesting, anyway. When the ritualistic brahmanas were arguing that Rich, that being a Brahmin is higher than a Vaishnava, is the highest position. And so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, being very strategic, first started glorifying the Brahmanas, so they let their guard down. This is fighting, you know, this is not just 
fighting, it's strategic. So when we talk about fighting, one has to be strategic. I want to make that point. Not that you just go out and challenge everyone, tell them they're all hogs, dogs, camels, and asses. You got to think practically. That's Kshatriya is not someone who just keeps, fights, you know, all over the place. Like just flails his arms everywhere and shoots everybody with a pistol. A Kshatriya is one who thinks very carefully about what he does. That's the general. Generally, the foot soldiers were not Kshatriyas. They were actually shooters. But the generals, the lieutenants and everything were Kshatriyas. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur first started praising uh, the uh, Brahmanas and the Brahmanas thought, wow, he's really cool. He's praising us. And then he established that Vaishnavism was superior and the poor Brahmana was just like, ah. And he was, people were so impressed with his argument that they were rushing up to touch his feet. And it was so dangerous that the police had to stop everyone from touching Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's feet. And they, they picked him up and they dunked his feet in a vat of water and then sprinkled the water on everybody. The famous story. So, I mean, if you look at our acharyas, you know, probably specific, and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, their stories too, the same thing. Uh, how they're dealing with these upasampradayas, upasampradayas, sorry, upasampradayas. You know, like in India, you've got all these bogus people, like you've got men who put on lipstick just to think they're gopis. Isn't it? I mean, this is ridiculous. It's some of the ugliest gopis you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> he was in Vrindavan one time, there was some like lipstick on, but he also had a partial beard, wearing a sari. I said, oh, he, these gopis are not going to dance with Krishna. <laughs> so, I mean, you have that in Bhakti, you know, Dakur, Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati Dakur. Uh, actually, Ramanujacharya, I mean, practically our, our uh, Bhagavacharya, our whole sampradaya is like that. Nirasesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Dejitarani. I mean, even Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra is based on that Kshatriya tendency, isn't it? Namaste Saraswati Deva, I, I offer my obeisances unto the energy or the disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, who has come to the Western world to fight with impersonalism and voidism, right? Nirvishesha, Sunyavadi, impersonalism and voidism. So it, even there's that Kshatriya mood in Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra. So this is the point Prabhupada is making here. And the final point Prabhupada makes is if you have that mood, then you can conquer the unconquerable. And who is the unconquerable? Ajitta. That's Krishna. In fact, that's mentioned by Srila Rupa Goswami as one of the qualities of pure devotional service. Anyone here read Nectar Devotion? What are the qualities of pure devotional service? Where's the first one? Immediate relief from all distress. Transcendental happiness. Rarely achieved. I'm not, I'm not speaking them all in order. Uh, and finally, it's the only means of attracting Krishna. Yeah, it's the only means of attracting Krishna. So, anyway, so this is the point that one can control Krishna. You should remember these points. One can control Krishna. That's another reason why devotional service is rarely achieved, because one, Krishna puts himself under the control of the devotees. Therefore, you have that statement in the Bhagavad Gita, Kuntaya Prati Janihi, Name Bhakti Pranashati. What is it? O son of Kunti, you should declare it boldly that my devotee will never perish. And Prabhupada comments in that regard that Krishna asks Arjuna to declare boldly because people won't always believe Krishna. Krishna's quite a tricky chap. You know, <laughs> he breaks his promise to protect Arjuna, like that in the Gita. Uh, in the battle of Kurukshetra. So, when a devotee promises, and Prabhupada has promised that if we follow the regular principles and serve Krishna with his lifetime, in this lifetime, and also take up this mission 
were very much mission-oriented. People should think of their mission. My mission is not just to eat prasadam and be happy. Our mission is to bring others so that they will eat prasadam and be happy. But we're, unfortunately, you know, a Kshatri is not thinking about himself. A Kshatri is thinking about humanity. You know, that's the point. That's a real Kshatri. Like Lord Ram, because he was thinking of his citizens, he actually sent Sita Devi away, right? He wasn't thinking, oh, my poor Sita Devi, all these citizens, oh, who cares, they're a bunch of shooters anyway. <laughs> it was actually a washerman who made the complaint about Sita Devi. It wasn't just like a Brahmin. Brahmins, they knew Sita Devi's. So in order to carry out his duties properly as a Kshatriya, he was engaged in self-sacrifice. And that's the mood, should be the mood of devotees, the sacrifice. One lifetime for Krishna. What do you think, Gopinath? One lifetime. Give this one lifetime. Next life, you know, go out and enjoy. But in, <laughs> in this lifetime, sacrifice for Krishna, and then you'll be happy. Okay, on that kind note, any questions or comments? Yes. Let's, may I comment on this point uh, yeah. of, of this Kshatriya like preaching? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a very interested, uh, interesting quotation from Shlabhakti Siddhanta Sarajri which sheds some light okay. uh, that uh, actually uh, there is a pragmatic transcendental reason for this kind of preaching. Okay. It's not on nature. It, may, yeah. may I read this yeah, sure, sure. quotation Go ahead. from Shlabhakti Siddhanta? The truth, satya, is propagated in a twofold way, positively or by the method of direct support and negatively by the method of opposition. The truth cannot be made sufficiently known by the positive method alone. Propaganda by the method of opposition, more than the presentation of the positive aspects, <laughs> brings about more brilliantly in this world the appearance and glorification of the truth. The positive method by itself is not the most effective mode of propaganda wow. Wow. in a controversial age like the present. The negative method which seeks to differentiate the truth from non-truth in all its forms is even better calculated to convey the directly inconceivable significance of the absolute. It is a necessity which cannot be conscientiously avoided by the dedicated preacher of the truth if he wants to be loyal servant of Godhead. The method is sure to create an atmosphere of controversy in which it is quite easy to lose one's balance of judgment. But the ways of deluding energy are so intricate that unless their mischievous nature is fully exposed it's not possible for the soul in conditional state, conditioned states to avoid the snares spread by enchantress or encompassing the ruin of her only willing victims. Wow. It is a duty which shall be sacred to all who have been enabled to obtain even a distant glimpse of the Absolute. Can you email me that quote? Sure, sure. It's wonderful. Please, please email. That's, a, that's an amazing quote. Another quote from him, where I don't, you know, this is a very short quote because I can't remember long quotes, is that one should be willing to shed gallons of blood to make a devotee. That's another quote. Gallons of blood. This is our mood, you know, not... And probably another quote from Prabhupada is, an easy time in Krishna consciousness don't go well together. Anyway, so many quotes come to mind. But that quote is amazing. That quote is amazing. So, it, you know, that really shows the in term of Kuna Prichanaya Sadhanam Vinishaya Shadiskritam. Like Krishna comes to establish religious principles, to protect the devotees, but also to annihilate the miscreants. Vinishaya Shadiskritam. So, of course, in this day and age, the miscreants and the devotees are in the same body. <laughs> so we got to annihilate the miscreant nature in the hearts. Very nice quote. Amazing quote. Please, please just 
forward it to me by email today if you, if you can. Okay, Eddie, that's shocking. Now I can become happier with Gopinath. So, <laughs> I feel justified. <laughs> yeah. How do we know what sort of sacrifice are we supposed to do? Um, two ways. One way, you're the guru. Another way is that we use our intelligence. How to maximize our impact. You know, what I call, like using modern language, value added. How can we do something that's that has the greatest value to add to Prabhupada's mission. Everybody has a particular value to add. You know, how to maximize that? You know, and, and what situation do I need to put myself in to maximize myself to the, in, in Prabhupada's mission? To, which means, you know, more devotees, happier devotees. You, you gotta maximize. You, does that make sense? That's how we should be thinking. We're missionaries. We're made for a mission. That's how we should think. We have a mission to accomplish. Mission impossible. Anyway. <laughs> so any other questions? Questions? Yes? I've had this question for some time in mind. From Bhagavad Gita, one stands, I don't remember the chapter. Yeah. Uh, Krishna says, Abhichetsu Duracharo Bhajate Maha Mananyabhak. Yeah. Would you give some examples? Yeah, my devotee is to be considered saintly in spite of the most abominable action. Uh, Prabhupada said that if a devotee accidentally deviates, then and then pulls himself back up, that's actually we don't consider the past in the devotee. Bhaktivinoda Thakur mentions that one of the ways to commit serious offenses against devotees is to talk about someone's past or to criticize them for some present reaction to some past activity uh, or their birth or something like that or you know physical deformity like that. That's an offense against a devotee because you're considering a devotee as an ordinary person, a charyamam, yanyam, nabhamanyam, karichit. So that's re in reference to an accidental fall down. But if someone premeditates, just like one devotee here premeditates this, they said this class is too heavy, I'm just gonna go out and smoke, smoke marijuana after class just to calm down. <laughs> that's premeditated. And there's no excuse for that. The devotee will have to suffer a reaction for that. But if a devotee accidentally slips, Let's say if a devotee walks by a sweet shop today and he sees a sweet in the, in the window and he buys it you know, impulsively. So that's what that verse refers to. Not that a devotee can do any sort of abominable action and be considered sanely. But if there's an accident in the devotee's past, then the devotee is considered sanely. If he picked himself up and is no longer doing it, then he's sanely. Like even in the case of Ajamil, he picked himself up. Well, as soon as he realized, even though his fall down had uh, been quite a few years, because he picked himself up, then we should not criticize Ajamil. We shouldn't, you know, we don't look at his past. And we are aware of his past to understand the principle there of Namabas Jenny, but we don't criticize Ajamil. He's not a rascal. He's a pure devotee, he went back to Godhead. And Krishna doesn't consider it like that. Krishna doesn't, Krishna doesn't say to people when they go back to Godhead, you know, hey, you used to be a dog. You know, therefore you should take a lesser position in the spiritual world. Krishna treats everyone equally. Does that make sense? So that's the meaning of that. But one has to come to the point of ananyava. That means of only serving Krishna. So Krishna there defines his devotee as someone, it's interesting too, he is someone who has no other activity other than serving him. That's Krishna's definition of a devotee. One time, a member of the Krishna conscious movement wrote Prabhupada and he called himself a devotee in the, in the letter. And Prabhupada said, 
A devotee never thinks of himself as a devotee. Even Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he said, you know, if I had devotion, if I, if, if I thought I was a devotee, if I was actually a devotee, I couldn't live. Because the feeling of separation from Krishna would be so intense. Of course, he did feel separation from Krishna. But still, a devotee means ananyabhak, ananyastintayantamam yejanak paripasate. That means having no other consideration other than serving Krishna. So, basically, most of us can just consider ourselves aspiring devotees. We're aspiring to be devotees. Because, I mean, honestly, can, can anyone say that I have no other consciousness other than serving Krishna. And even a pure devotee won't think like that. A pure devotee will think like Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, oh Gopinath, I'm a materialistic rascal, always take this sinner weeping, weeping uh, to your lotus feet, right? A pure devotee is humble. That's one of the qualities of a pure devotee. Should not appease in each and at all you should not. Mani na mani dena kirtini asara. Any other questions? No? Go be nice. No questions. Yes? Just on that same point, I have heard that, um, you know, I think it was a quote from Bhakti Sansa, so you know, was saying that um, basically these fall downs, they're like tests from Krishna, and if he wants you to fail, he wants you to see how you kind of pick yourself up. And the example I think was given that if you rub sandal with um, then you know, nice fragrance comes yeah. out. So it's like a lotus having hard times sometimes. Yeah, there's struggle. Krishna doesn't want you to fail. I want to clarify that. Krishna gives you tests. But if you do fail a particular test, I mean, and we're not talking about breaking the regular principles. You know, sometimes people do fail tests. Then you have to take the test over again. You can't run away from a test. I mean, you can run away from it, but then let's say you run to the other side of the world, New Zealand or something, to get away from a test. And then you find the same test is there. <laughs> so it's like, it's school. If you want to graduate, even if you don't graduate from one school, you got to go to another university <coughs> and take the same course and the same test over again. <coughs> so, you know, Krishna gives us many tests. Every day, it tests. And the tests get harder, too. The more advanced you get, the harder the tests get. It's just like in school. The more mathematics you learn, the harder it gets. You know, once you learn one and one is two, then what happens after that? Oh yeah, then math multiplication after that. Then after that, you get, I guess, calculus or something like that. And, uh, then you learn uh, Pythagorean theory. Then you learn multidimensional calculus. Then you learn statistics. It gets harder and harder and harder. It's fun, yeah. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, question is additional question to the discussion that how we know that we pass the test. How do we know when they pass the test? Krishna gives you a new test. There's <laughs> 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 never, never an end to the test. Look what the Pandavas had to go through. You know, I mean, it's actually. You know, <laughs> Did you, pass, did you pass a particular test because you feel Krishna's mercy there? You know what Krishna's please. Okay, I think we have to end. It's time to pass the test for Prashadam. Okay, all glorious is my grace. Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada, Here we are in Finland, everyone. This is Finland, Helsinki, with all the nice Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis. Okay. Oh, see? That's Anurada. She's from New Zealand. And we got a Latvian here. Different devotees. Okay. And there's Gopinath, who's my most surrendered disciple. <laughs>